Hey, everybody, it is Trags Mike Petralia back with another episode of the Jungle Roar podcast powered by CLNS Media and Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. Well, the news, of course, this week is happening hot and heavy uh, in Bengaland as it is throughout the NFL, of course. Free agency has uh, come about us, and uh, one big piece of news right off the top. I'm joined by Richard Skinner, Skinny of Local 12. Um, Right off the top is the uh, trade of Joe Mixon. We initially thought, Skinny, that it was going to be a release of Joe Mixon, save that $3 million roster bonus uh, that he was due on Sunday. But as it turns out, the Bengals will trade him to the Houston Texans. Why? Because the Texans lost Devin Singletary to the New York Giants. So they had a need and the Bengals wanted to move on from Joe Mixon. Sounds like a win-win to me. Yeah, I was wondering, because obviously there would be a compensatory pick equivalent for Joe Mixon if he signed with the team. I'm assuming because we've not heard the the, what the get back is yet right. that they felt maybe they were they were getting back in the trade value um and it probably is not a lot but maybe they think it's more than what they would have gotten in the compensatory pick that's really the only way this makes sense to me um but again you know you get something for it and and that always makes sense because they were going to move on from joe mixon with the tea leaves have been on the wall since october the 18th when brian callahan said the famous quote of we get what's blocked and not much more correct and i do think uh the bengals were doing mixing a solid here because they're trading him to a very good offense, a very yeah. uh, sensational young quarterback in C.J. Stroud. There are worse places Joe Mixon could have been sent off to or worry about what he's going to do, who's going to pick him up, because let's face it, you know, yes, he had his, I believe it was third career 1,000-yard rushing season this past year, yeah. and, and, and he's still productive, but he wasn't going to get, you know, huge numbers as it is. He's going to a a team that certainly has a need for a running back like him. And it looks like to me, uh, he lands on it in a soft landing spot uh, to continue his career. Yeah. I mean, Devin Singletary had big games last year, including against the Bengals and kind of a revival from him because, you know, he kind of washed out in in Buffalo and, um, you know, he he obviously did enough to get signed by another team. I do go back to wondering though, Mike, because again, they were ready to move on from Joe Mixon. The tea leaves, we all read them. We all knew it was coming. um, All of those things Um, to trade him inside the conference to a playoff caliber team that you may have to go through. Um, Again, I think you're right. They did do him a solid because he's got a chance to do some things there. But I, it makes me wonder even more if they just thought there's just not much left in the tank and we're not worried about this. And maybe they're getting more back in return than we initially right. are no, led right. to believe. So we'll uh, see how that uh, turns out. And certainly the Texans did have a need. And again, they fulfill uh, that need. And now let's move on to the flip side of the coin. Joe Mixon's not here. The Bengals still save his $6.1 million cap charge uh, that they were going to get if they were to cut him anyway. So they still get to save that. They pick up Zach Moss. He was drafted out of Utah by the Buffalo Bills, spent his first three seasons with the Bills, last two seasons with the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, And it's a classic Bengal signing to me in free agency. Low risk, high reward. They're not spending a lot of money. uh, And I think the fact that they're bringing on a guy like uh, Zach Moss, two years, $8 million, I guess, um, you know, includes a $4.525 million uh, guarantee or payout uh, in year one. So um, your read on uh, adding Zach Moss to the roster. It was a guy actually when I, I did uh, six different positional free agency pieces last week as previews, and it was kind of the guy I targeted because of not just player value. I mean, look, if, if you were going to go player value, I would say go pluck Derrick Henry, go plus Josh, Josh Jacobs. You're also looking for financial value in, in that regard. I, I didn't think they were going to spend more than what they saved in salary cap savings from Joe Mixon, which is about $6.1 million. Point. So Great point. somewhere in that range, that's where they landed basically is about a $4 million average per year. They actually saved a little bit. And, and I think to the quotes from, from Zach Taylor, um, at the combine about Chase Brown and, and about how excited he is to see what he can do with more touches. And what we saw is that uh, Chase Brown do down the stretch. I truly think they were looking for not a bell cow back, just a rotational back. And and I think you'll see 
I don't want to say it'll be split up 50 50, but it might be in workload and you're, you don't need to spend for that. And you'd certainly, if, you, if that's the route you were going to go with Joe Mixon in a best case scenario to keep him was splitting exact time with, with, with Chase Brown. Well, that's a, a big number to carry for a rotational back. In my opinion, this is not, it's $2 million less. You can put it into something else. They still got a, a bunch of needs. And I know we're going to talk about here and it doesn't sound like much, but that two mil could go a long way in, in some regards. Well, and that's the whole thing. And I wrote about this on Sunday in my, you know, Bengals beat notes column that um, the Bengals do have a lot of areas to fill and they are not a team that likes to spend a lot in one position. They like to spread out uh, the pie, if you will. And, you know, the Blackburns are very fond of using that term that, and Duke Tobin is as well. Tobin especially, yeah. Yeah, especially Duke uh, is fond of using, you know, the pie is only so big and there are only so many ways that you can split it. And once it's gone, it's gone. So uh, I think that is what the Bengals have in mind here uh, when you're talking about, you know, spreading out the money. I, look, I would be shocked if the free agency doesn't end or when this week ends, the Bengals have not invested in defensive tackles and in an offensive tackle. I would agree. And probably a depth piece at cornerback, a veteran depth piece at corner at a, you know, a, a very reasonable rate. And, and honestly, maybe that, that depth piece of corner comes in part because of this, this $2 million savings in the running back room, you allocate it to some other place. And, and I think it's, it's a smart way to go about it. Um, you know, you've got, again, you've got your rotational running back. They signed Mike Kosicki as a, as a second tight end after yep. re-signing Drew Sample. Um, you know, I, I still fully expect them to get back Tanner Hudson and or Mitchell Wilcox um, to fill that room out. Um, you know, then, then you've signed Geno Stone at safety to then at the very least it's your backup plan. If Dax Hill doesn't pan out or they're already ready to shove Dax to the cornerback position, like we all believe they are. Um, so, you know, they had a lot of, believe it, they had a lot of needs, Mike, in, in this free agency cycle. And I think they're going to do a great job of addressing all of those. I know everybody wants the splash signing the star player, the difference maker. Right. Well, last I checked, you got a difference maker. He wears number nine. You got a difference maker. He wears number one. You got a couple of days. You got, you got a difference maker on defense. He wears number nine. You got some difference makers, man. Now you need to build up the depth. I want to finish up a few things here on Zach yep. Moss. Last year, 14 carries, 100, just 14 games, I should say, 183 yes. carries, 794 yards, not bad, 4.3 yards per carry. I'd say that's an average. Um, year before, 76 carries, 365. That's 4.8. That's, I think, more along the lines of what the, the Bengals would like to see from the 26-year-old yes. uh, Zach Moss that 2022 season uh, with the Colts when, of course, he was running tandem with uh, Jonathan Taylor. Had something to do with that, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, he's got six touchdowns rushing over the last – two seasons after having four touchdowns in uh, each of his first two seasons with Buffalo. So we'll see if the production uh, ticks up this year uh, as I think what will happen is what you kind of alluded to skinny. Um, he's going to kind of share the load in the backfield with chase Brown in terms of his uh, receiving production uh, last year, 27 catches, which was a career high um, on 37 targets, 192 yards, uh, average 7.1 yards, and he did have two touchdowns. So he is a guy that I think the Bengals uh, can look to not just to run the ball, but catch the ball as well. I want to get on to the tight end position because a friend of mine back in New England, did you know I used to cover the Patriots? Uh, I did not. Are you, are you in the Netflix? Are you in the Dynasty special, by the way? Tune in episode seven, Skinny, midway okay. through. That guy that asked Tom Brady, what did you know and when did you know it? That would be um, somebody you're talking to right now. I'll be this darned. Matter. I'll be darned. Yeah. Um, so That's there's really that. Good, uh, but anyway, Mike Gesicki, I think, is a, a fascinating sign for the Bengals. Uh, he uh, signs here in Cincinnati for one year get the number here worth a deal worth up to 3.25 million dollars obviously again very low risk high reward somebody told me in new england that this is a guy that could maybe spell a little bit of tyler boyd's role getting downfield getting open he's not known for his blocking skills but he is known as a pass catcher. And if you take a look at his numbers between 2019 with Miami and 2021 with Miami, those three seasons, he averaged 695 yards, 13 yards a catch, 
and he had uh, 13 touchdowns. That's great production from your tight end. Yeah, and, and I'm going to take this past year in New England with a little bit of a grain of salt when you mention the numbers. They sound low, and they are low, and there's two factors. I mean, he split time with Hunter Henry, number one, right. and Mac Jones was a disaster of a quarterback, number two, and that offense was a disaster, number three. Right. Uh, th this feels very much – I don't I tried to equate it in my mind to the Hayden Hurst signing where you saw production in the past from him. Hayden was a former first-round talent. Gasicki's a former second-round talent. You alluded to the success he had in Miami. He's not old by any stretch of the imagination. I thought with Irv Smith they were trying to catch lightning in a bottle, and they didn't. I thought with Hayden Hurst it was more him getting the opportunity again to be the man, and he showed it. And, and this feels like this is kind of that – type of signing it would it would not shock me to see Mike Gusecki get back to that 50 plus catch 600 yard level uh as, as a receiving tight end for the Bengals unless they bring back Tanner Hudson and he fills some of that role too um if it's Mike Gusecki's your main receiving tight end I think he easily gets to those numbers and the thing is skinny that I've noticed with Joe Burrow is he wants his tight ends to win off the line of scrimmage if they win off the line of scrimmage win downfield He's going to get the ball to the tight yep. end. The problem, and and I think even yours truly included, kind of forgets sometimes, is the reason Joe Burrow hasn't been throwing to the tight end a lot is they're not open. And well, yeah. to not be open for Joe Burrow is saying something. Because what is the old expression uh, Joe Burrow likes to use? If I can see your helmet, you're open. Yep. Well, that's a problem. And if Joe Burrow doesn't think you're open um, – you know, obviously the ball's not coming your way. He's not going to usually not going to force it unless your name's Jamar Chase or T Higgins. Uh, speaking of T Higgins, Skinny, your thoughts on David Mulligetta, Athletes First, coming out on Monday and essentially speaking for, um, through sources, I would assume, speaking for T Higgins, demanding a trade. What was your read on that? Bless their heart. Good God love you. I mean, you have no leverage in this game, my right. man. You have none. I mean, that's the that's the funny part to this. And, and to the Bengals' credit, when we were at the Combine, and we all wrote it, um, you know, they, they didn't slam the door on a potential trade. Uh, they didn't say it out loud that, hey, we are taking trade offers. It was implied. Um, they, they, you know, that, hey, you want to give us an offer. But as you know, Mike, A, the offer has to be off the charts for you to consider it. There's not right. a lot of teams that can make that off-the-chart offer. And then B, that team also has to have the understanding that they're going to likely sign him to an extension. There's a lot of moving parts there. And so when if teams don't come at the Bengals with some mega offer, and I don't suspect that's going to take place, then what are you going to do, David get and T. Higgins? I know what you're going to do. You're not going to come to OTAs. That's fine. They're they're voluntary. Jesse Bates didn't either. I everybody in the world, their teammates under all, all understand that. You'll you'll pout and and maybe think you're showing some leverage by not coming to training camp right away like Jesse Bates did. In the end, Jesse Bates knew what he had to do, which was sign the franchise tag, play on the franchise tag, you know, hold his breath that he didn't get hurt, but he played great and he got paid. And that's where T. Higgins, listen, T. Higgins is not coming off of a great year. He had some drop issues. He's he's got a now a lingering injury history that even made me wonder whether they should franchise tag him. I'm not against it. I think it, I would have gone either way sure. with it. But but you have no leverage in this in this deal. You can say you're not going to not play on the tag. I mean, you're just not. You're you're not you're not going to give up twenty one. Last player, million, I think that of note to not do that with Le'Veon Bell, right? I mean, Correct. And that was later in his career. Right. And, and I think that that whole instance was at that point. I think everybody understood. Yeah, we got no leverage in this game. We can try all we want. I mean, hey, as players, you dudes collectively bargained this man. It's something that teams are allowed to use, and they yeah. used it. And I, listen, I. I I always feel for that guy in the last year of his rookie deal, like a T that's hoping for the extension. And when the sides can't come to it, you know, they're likely going to tag him At the same time. The tag of $21.8 million is guaranteed upon signing it. If you get hurt in week one of next season and don't play again, they owe you $21.8 million. I know it's not 94 million over four years or whatever the heck you think they think they're going to get. I get that, but it's pretty damn good generational wealth for one year of service. And frankly, there's very few injuries that are truly uh, knock wood here. Uh, yeah, right. Career ending. I mean, right. almost yes. any injury you, you can come back from. Uh, and I but, think I think he needs to show the market too, Mike. I think he need, if he thinks he's going to get paid like a one, I think he needs to have a season that's commensurate to being a one. And I don't think he had that this past year. Not even I mean, close. I, I mean, I think you know he would tell you that. Yeah, that's probably because look at at the other side that I'm playing with, and that's Jamar Chase, uh, and look at Tyler Boyd, look at all the other options that have been there uh, in the Bengals' passing game. 
also, did you find it significant that Mulligata put in there that little stipulation that he really still loves Cincinnati, you know, would love to come back and play long term with Cincinnati, just not under these terms. He had to put yeah. that in there just to make sure there were no sore feelings. And I do think there's some truth to that. I just think they're at an impasse where the Bengals have their number. Mulligetta has his number and they're just not going to budge off of it either way. You know, right. Mulligetta, he gets what he wants to, he gets what he gets for his clients. He's really good at it. I mean, you, you see a bunch of these free agents that are signing our Mulligetta clients. He got Jesse Bates paid. Y again, you may have been holding your breath that whole year that he played on the tag, but right. you got your guy paid and, and good for you. I just, the Bengals are at a number. They're at a number. And it seems like they, since March of last year, they haven't moved off that number, and neither side's willing to do so. That's why T sounded in. And I'm using quotes here because it's not a direct quote from him. It was right. you know from from Adam Schefter who reported it uh, initially that you know he's disappointed they haven't had talks since since March of last year. Well, again, if you're on a number, they're on a number, and neither one of you are going to budge in any way. Ain't nothing to talk about anymore. By the way, I know you had alluded to it earlier. We're jumping all over the map. I'm talking with uh, Richard Skinner of. Channel 12 here in Cincinnati, local 12 skinny is where you can find them on X. We, uh, you alluded to Irv Smith, uh, Jr. Uh, Adam Schefter, as we're recording, this has the news that, uh, Irv Smith Jr. Has reached an agreement with the Kansas city chiefs on a one-year deal. Good for Irv Smith. We got like seven tight ends out there. Good luck making the club kid. I mean, with Travis Kelsey still coming back, we assume for another year, uh, you know, obviously, you know, that's a great situation for Irv, though. I mean, you know, I think he's got a chance certainly to make the roster as maybe the third tight end out there in, in a, in a, on a team that they do feature the tight end and they do want depth uh, and maybe who knows, uh, maybe Travis Kelsey doesn't take as many snaps, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. There. Well, he's probably not going to take many snaps either because he stinks but there's that that's harsh, but the production would kind of suggest uh, yes. the production of 2023 with the Cincinnati Bengals would kind of uh, suggest that. Okay. Uh, another player that I uh, also alluded to in my column on Sunday would be a possibility. And I know you uh, spoke of him earlier. Skinny is Geno stone. I find this to be a fascinating signing, a very uh, potentially, uh, smooth and uh, surreptitious signing a very uh, strategic signing for the Bengals to add a 24 year old safety to their roster will be 25 shortly. Um, but I think it's an inter a significant move for the Bengals to add depth on the back end. And he is very respected by the Bengals as somebody who is kind of a ball hawk. Yeah. In fact, you know, like I said, I, I did those each day, different position groups and he's kind of the guy I landed on at safety. Again, I listed like all the guys ranked and then you have to do the caveat of, Hey, these guys at the top of this level, they're not going to pay that kind of money. Right. When you went down the chart and you kind of looked at, 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 at kind of market value, I know you do the same thing, go to spotrack.com and they kind of right. set a market value. That's not etched in stone. It just gives you a ballpark. And their ballpark figure for him was three years, 21.6 mil. And I think I wrote that that $7 million average sounds about right. And what do they end up getting for? Two years and $15 million. And uh, That's seven great and a half money, million. if you ask me. I think me. it's a perfect fit. It's a perfect value. Yeah. Um, I know if you want to be a cynic about the signing, you can draw a comparison to Nick Scott because Nick only really started one year in, in, in his career with the Rams. Um, kind of the same for Geno Stone. This past year was kind of his first time as a full-time starter. But to your point, he had an, uh, a high grade. He was graded the seventh highest graded pass coverage safety in the NFL from pro football focus. Uh, he led all safeties in the NFL with interceptions with seven, um, made a bunch of big plays for them. And, and I, it feels like he's more of a merging player than Nick Scott was more of a, hey, we need another safety. We got to go get somebody and and more of a, a, a you know, a, a bridge, a, a depth piece. Yeah, a bridge. If you're good, good point. I think Geno Stone is a legit starter back there that, okay, now you can make your decision on Dax Hill. Uh, maybe you can kick the tires on Dax as a safety and OTAs and see how the communication's going and if it works out. But as Lou Anarumo told us at the combine, right, he said, we want to give him one thing to do. To me, that would sound like if we can get our veteran safety, we are going to start this process of moving Dax back to the corner position full time. And then Dax, on your roster, Mike, if you've got Jordan Battle and, and Geno Stone, 
and then your depth pieces, and it may be somebody different. But for now, let's just say Nick Scott, Tyson Anderson, those are your four safeties. Dax does give you a fifth safety option for depth purposes if something happens, and it wouldn't be catastrophic. I mean, again, he didn't play great last year, but it's not like you're sticking somebody back there who's never played if that's the case. So I think it's a it's a it's a perfect signing because it gives you a veteran, uh, uh, you know, to go along with an emerging Jordan battle, and it, and it gives you the chance now to do something with Dax Hill that I think still makes him a very productive player for them moving forward. And it also, let's not forget, it gives you a player that knows Lamar Jackson played yep. with Lamar J on the other side of yeah, the ball, of course. But he's, he's dead to Lamar Jackson now, Lamar says. What's that? I thought, great, I thought Lamar's tweet was pretty good. Did oh, I, did, I missed that tweet. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're dead to me. It was, oh. it was great. Lamar's got a very, very good sense of humor. All right. I'm going to finish it up on, finish the Jungle War podcast this week up. Uh, with this question to you, Skinny, last year it was Orlando Brown Jr. kind of coming out of nowhere, kind of his signing falling to the Bengals. Do you see something like that happening again this year for the Bengals? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you this question. The tackle movement hasn't been all that lively so far in free agency. I, right. I, I sent a text to my boss this morning and I said, you know, the longer this goes, I wonder, and I don't think this is going to happen, but I wonder, are they trying to find a way to bring Jonah Williams back? So I... I asked Paul Daner Jr. that question, and he's like, probably not, but I wouldn't rule anything out. Hey, there's a possibility. I think I do think even the harsh feelings aside from last summer, and we remember uh, what Jonah Williams had to work through, not feeling slighted by the Bengals for not supposedly having any communication uh, after they signed Orlando Brown Jr. and being told, okay, you're going to have to move to right tackle. And there were some harsh feelings, but it, I wouldn't put it past Jonah and the Bengals to kind of like, you know, put a Band-Aid on it. Everything's healed pretty good. Uh, let's move forward. And you're playing for a team that has Super Bowl aspirations every year with Joe Burrow as your quarterback. Yeah, Mike, I mean, as we're recording this in the early afternoon of Tuesday, I mean, we could get off this podcast and he could sign with somebody in the next 30 sure. minutes for all we know. Um, but, you know, I thought he was going to be fairly coveted in free agency. And, and it makes me wonder that, you know, the, the market out there, the main of the Bengals said, give us a couple of days. You still have, or te technically, for those that know, he's still technically under contract with the Bengals till four o'clock on Wednesday. So right. they could re-sign him at any time between now and then. And that's why I wonder if maybe the Bengals said, pump the brakes for a second. If you got a figure out there, you got, that's fine. We want to kick a figure back to you. I, I just wonder that now, because I would have thought Jonah would have been maybe even plucked off the market by now. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe the value for him out there isn't as much as I think, but I think there's a value for him out there. And the bank or the Patriots, I should uh, say, just brought back uh, their own Michael Wenu. Uh, yep. That's a big name off the uh, potential markets. Uh, yep. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. Anything else on your mind? No, uh, I do think, like I said, to your point, I think that we're still going to see them sign a defensive tackle, at least one. They're going to have to obviously fill, fill the right tackle need, probably a depth piece at, at corner. I'm leaning against the receiver, the slot receiver, but maybe that's an option. And honestly, maybe Tyler Boyd's an option to bring back on a one-year deal. I don't, yeah, I'm not ruling that one out yet either. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm not going to rule that one out either. W but I think if they were to do that, they they would have to have confidence that they'd have enough money to do it. That, that'd be yeah, hard. but I, again, I, I just wondered, that's sometimes for these guys, when you go go to the market and you find out the market isn't what you think it should be for you, um, you know, sometimes the grass isn't always greener. I, I do think Tyler will probably strike a two-year deal with somebody out there, probably what he thinks the market is for him, but it's it may come after a few days. Yeah, uh, by the way, I'm going to go back to T. Higgins real quick. Your thoughts on Mike Hilton's tweet? I did Monday? not see his tweet. What did he say? I, I missed uh, his tweet. Uh, something along the lines of, oh, boy. Like he was stunned that uh, T Higgins had requested a trade and everybody wanted to make, you know, a big thing about that, that the, the, the Bengals are turning on the, on the organization, the players are turning on the or organization. And I didn't take it that way at all. Yeah. And, and I guess that to close that up, to wrap that up, I'm glad you mentioned that because I know there is hand wringing about what, what's T going to be like when he comes back? Is he going to be a malcontent? Listen, Jesse Bates signed it, swallowed hard and played, but played well. Jonah Williams, right. Demanded a trade. Well, is Jonah going to come back and be a pro? Of course he was going to be a pro, and he was. T. Higgins is going to be a pro. He's going to – I get he's upset. I get that his agent's angry. T. Higgins is going to come in that locker room. He's going to be a good locker room guy. He's going to play hard. Yep. He's going to try to – because he's going to try to go do the best he can to get paid. 
And there's there are very good leaders in that locker room, starting with number nine, and especially right. guys like Sam Hubbard uh, and Mike Hilton. Uh, there's enough, and Ted Karras. There are enough leaders in that locker room to keep a guy like that on the even keel. And as a former Patriot once told me, the check clears just the same. It's exactly right. There's that. I mean, that is literally that's the bottom line portion of that program. Yes, it is. Well, Skinny, I appreciate you uh, joining me on short notice. We've both got a lot going on, obviously, uh, monitoring the NFL free agent whirlwind that is every single year in the second week of March. Anything you're, you you want to plug uh, while I have I you on here? You got, we're, I, I've got a column going up on why the Bengals uh, it was the right decision to move on from Joe Mixon and, and why you shouldn't have been surprised that they did it. That probably will go up at some point this afternoon. And of course, all this, all the signings, get them up as quickly as I possibly, my fingers can tight, Mike. And, and you that's too. what I'm, and that's what I'm doing. As soon as the button flips off on this uh, podcast, I will be doing likewise. All right. He is Richard Skinner, local 12 skinny on X. Be sure to follow him for great Bengals coverage and coverage of NFL free agency. My name is Mike Petralia. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Jungle War podcast, as always powered by CLNS Media and Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. Until next week, keep that jungle roaring.